projective surface with a positive geometric genus, first birthday number equal to We wanted to compute the uh, virtual Euler number of uh, this modelized space of stable sheaves of rank 2 with joint classes C1. But okay, um, <clears throat> so over this virtual fundamental class uh, of um, uh, the uh, tangent uh, of the churn class in the virtual dimension of the virtual tangent one. And so we had the uh, Mochizuki's formula. which uh, allows us to compute just such a thing in terms of Hilbert schemes of points. So I will maybe review it. So if E over S times the modelized space is a universal sheaf, then we can look at classes. And if P of E is a polynomial in classes tau E of alpha K, which is just I push forward to the modelized space some i churn class of universal sheaf capped with a push forward of a class alpha k, where alpha k is in the homology of S. So if I have any polynomial in these, then I can compute this integral. of this over the modelized space of sheaves in terms of something on Hilbert schemes of points. <coughs> I mean, I will use the, uh, maybe I will not precisely write down the formula, but anyway, we have somehow, we take C1, uh, we write it as a sum of two classes. We take the zyberg witten invariant of the first And we take the coefficient of s to the 0 of some expression a, depending on a1, a2. Uh, you have c2 minus a1, a2 is some integer uh, s, where um, I will not precisely say what this is, but psi, uh, so this thing, a, a1, a2 uh, <coughs> uh, and S is uh, the sum over all N1 plus N2 adding up to N, the integral over the product of these Hilbert schemes points of a suitable expression, which uh, is called psi A1, A2, uh, N1, N2. S, which uh, maybe later I will need to precise at some point the precise form, but maybe not now. You anyway won't remember. Okay, so this uh, what we, but this was a rather complicated expression, um, and so it means we can compute instead of the modelized space of sheaves, we can compute on Hilbert schemes of points. But the price is that the formula becomes more complicated, and um, but uh, the point is that we do not know how to directly compute anything on this modelized space of sheaves, so it is an advantage. We have at least a space that we understand reasonably well. And so we can try to compute. So if we want to apply this uh, to the virtual Euler number, if you remember, uh, the definition of the tangent bundle. Here we compute the virtual tangent bundle. This was a certain, uh, essentially some relative x. So it, 
if we uh, it follows by the Gurten de Monroe Uh, applied to the projection from S times M to M, uh, that uh, this uh, CVD of TM there is indeed, so VD is always the expected dimension, uh, is, uh, is of the form P of E. As before, it can be expressed in terms of these tau classes. And in the same way, if we look at chi minus y uh, uh, of uh, this modelized space, virtual version, uh, we again find by applying the virtual human uh, gives that this is also of the form. Uh, so this is also the integral of some p of e over the model I space. Okay, so in both cases, and one can explicitly say, uh, I mean, compute what these things are and express it. We will <coughs> maybe see a bit more later. So that means, in particular, we can apply Mochizuki's formula uh, to this, to both these situations, and also to many more general ones. Um, <coughs> now. As I said, this expression is very complicated, so um, we cannot really directly understand it. So we will try to establish some properties to uh, make it more palatable. And so these are two uh, properties that we want, uh, cobordism invariance and uh, uh, multiplicativity. Which will then allow us to reduce the computation to the case of toric surfaces and apply localization. So, <clears throat> so we have this thing that we want to compute. So, uh, so we have to, in order to evaluate this expression, we have to uh, compute this expression and then take the coefficient of s to the zero. So the expression is this. So um, first, if you don't know what to do with something, you put it into a generating function and hope that something emerges. So we make a generating function. So I write, say, z prime of s a1, so generating function. Uh, z prime of s say a1, a2, this variable s and q, this is just the sum over all n bigger equal to zero of this thing, n s, maybe q to the n, where q is a variable. This is some kind of partition function. And uh, <clears throat> now we uh, want to say something general about this. And the, the first thing we can say is that it only depends on the intersection numbers which are in this question. So this is the cobordism invariant. So, <clears throat> so proposition uh, there's a polynomial say p tilde in uh, all the numbers we have, say, a1 squared. So these are, a1 and a2 are classes in the second cohomology, so I can uh, consider their intersection numbers. No? So I just want to look at the numbers, a1 squared, a1, a2, a2 squared, and we can have a1 times ks, a2 times ks, and ks squared, and chi of OS. So these are all the intersection numbers you can make out of the surface S and, uh, and natural classes on the surface, uh, and, and these A1, A2. And um, then 
the statement is uh, such that uh, this thing a a1 a2 and s is equal to this polynomial so I mean Universally, there's one polynomial depending only on these, and then this is for all a1, a2, n, and s. So this here, I should have said, by definition, this depends, I write here maybe s, to remember that we are, this depends on s. Um, p tilde of is a1 squared, a1, a2, and so on, all the things that we have until chi of os. So this is the first thing. So this done, does not depend in some complicated general way on the geometry of the situation, but only on these intersection numbers. And in, what? To what extent the assumption on D1 is important for this proposition? If you that D1 is equal to D1? Ah, well, yeah, uh, I mean, I think there will, there will be some, you know, so if B1 is not equal to zero, you, uh, I think, have to, change the story with the Mochizuki formula a little bit. Also, anyway, Mochizuki's formula was under the assumption that B1 is equal to zero, so one would have to first generalize the proof. I don't think there's a very serious problem here with the multiplicativity. I mean, there, it's something about Hilbert schemes of points. It has nothing really to do with B1, uh, that you have this, uh, this fact that it uh, only depends on the numbers in the situation. But you first would have to establish uh, a version of Mochizuki's formula. And, uh, I mean, I there, there will be one, but uh, it hasn't been done, and it, uh, so <laughs> that's. Uh, um, and there, there might be few more terms. No, there is, may, could be some kind of uh, something that happens in the in the Picard group of the surface. Maybe some intersection numbers. We would have to see, but it it, it will be uh, uh, like this. I think in at least for the wall crossing formula. Munoz had some, some wall crossing formula, uh, which uh, also when B1 is bigger than zero, and there are some, there are some additional terms in it, which uh, have to do with, you know, with what happens in the first cohomology of the surface. So you maybe, it's not just, you know, you don't then just have intersection numbers in the second cohomology, but you also have to see what happens between the first and the third cohomology and so on. So it's a bit, uh, um, okay. <coughs> Um, so this uh, is some old, some modification of some old argument that I had with Enningsud and Lehn, and it's based on some inductive scheme to understanding Hilbert schemes of points. So this is based on an inductive scheme. Uh, to compute on Hilbert schemes of points. I will just uh, kind of sketch what's going on here. Namely, it's based on the following observation. Um, so whatever, call it, it's actually not so difficult, but anyway, proposition. Well, it's also, I mean, I call it theorem, although it's actually not so difficult. Um, if I take uh, this universal family, so this was this instance variety between points and subschemes, such that x lies in the subscheme. So we look at this. And we also then, given this, we can also look at another incidence variety, namely called S n n plus one. Some version of it was also uh, is also re related to these Nakajima operators. So this is another incidence variety, namely we have a subscheme Z and W, where one is in the Hilbert scheme n points, the other one is in the Hilbert scheme n plus one points, and um, z is a subscheme of w. 
And now these are, we have a relation here, namely this thing is the blow up of the, so we li are here in the product of S times Sn along the universal subscheme. And it is also non singular. I mean, it's actually not very difficult to prove. Uh, obviously, you can see that if you are outside the universal subscheme, if you have a, a point and a subscheme which are disjoint from each other, you can make a subscheme of length one more by just adding the point to the subscheme. And uh, you find that you can also somehow extend the subscheme precisely uh, by going to the blow up. Um, now, <clears throat> given this, you can, so the, this blow up can be understood reasonably well. You know what the, uh, you can say something about the, the normal sheaf and so on. So you can understand what happens in this blow up, also the cohomology classes. And so therefore you can make up the following inductive scheme. So we have here, uh, have here our Hilbert scheme of endpoints. Then we can go to this incidence variety by just uh, kind of in this thing projecting to the second factor. We will call this QN. We can uh, project here to the complementary factor S and as you know, this was this thing is the blow up of S n minus one uh, of S times S n minus one along this universal subscheme. So we can uh, do the blow down, and then we can. Uh, this was n minus one, and now we can just leave always factors of S here and do the same to this factor. So we can here have here say Q n minus one. This goes to S times S n minus 2, n minus 1, and p n minus 2 goes to s2 times s n minus 2. And uh, you know, we go on like this. Here we have s times s, s, what is it, n minus 2 times s12 maps to s n. And I'm not sure I, maybe this is p1 and this is uh, Q2. And so we have this picture. And so we want to somehow compute something on the Hilbert scheme of points. So say alpha is a class on this, and we want to uh, integrate it over the Hilbert scheme of points. Then we can pull it back here this gives me the same integral, we can push it down here and we get the same integral. So this is the same. So first we pull it back. So this is the integral is, as the map has degree n here, this is um, the integral for s n minus 1 n of the q n star alpha. And uh, then we, if one, in, Integrating over something and over the push forward to something is always the same. So this is 1 over n integral uh, over p n minus 1 star q n upper star alpha. And then you can keep doing this. Uh, and in the end, you get the integral over just the n fold product of uh, you know, P1 star Q2 upper star and so on until P n minus one lower star Q n upper star alpha. And each time you pull back, you get a factor, uh, whatever the number of the Hilbert scheme is. So it's uh, one over n factorial times this. So this is uh, how we can compute it. And the point is, so to 
a pullback in this context is always something trivial. So it's easy to, you know, that doesn't do anything. And the push forward is usually difficult because you have to understand uh, the map well. But we understand uh, this blow down well enough so that one can explicitly say what happens to many cohomology classes after being pushed forward. And so one can actually figure out what this thing is. And so then we have just an integral over the Hilbert scheme, over the n-fold product of some cohomology classes, which we can say of what kind they are, and then you will find it is such a polynomial. Okay. <clears throat> so this is this uh, thing. So this is for the Hilbert scheme of points. In our case, uh, you know, well, anyway, we do integrals over Hilbert schemes of points so that, uh, I mean, some modifications maybe of the argument will be necessary for precisely our setting, but this is how it works in general. Okay. So the second uh, nice property, uh, we want one other property. <coughs> so we get somehow that this thing is some polynomial in all these numbers. We don't know, you know, some... The, this is, in principle, we compute it here, but we kind of just keep track of uh, what terms occur, not what precisely it is. So we have no clue what precisely this polynomial is. It would be a very, it's a very complicated to follow this uh, procedure in detail. And uh, maybe not even very advisable to try. <coughs> but we can say one more thing, which is the multiplicativity. Namely, um, I had this z prime, which was this generating function of, uh, say, a1, a2, s, so it depended on s, uh, and q, which was this generating function of these, where one, so sum these things with n, q to the n. Um, and so it's kind of, it, you know, we, we pull out the constant term, so the coefficient of q to the zero, which one can easily compute. So this would be 2s times to the power chi of s times 2s to the holomorphic Euler characteristic of uh, uh, the line bundle. So, so I write it additively, a1 minus, uh, a2 minus a1. Uh, times the same, somehow the other way around. So these are line bundles. So A1 and A2 are line bundles. So I can take A2 to the, A2 tends A1 to the minus one, uh, and we take the holomorphic order characteristic. And so we get this expression. This is the term which does not depend on Q, and times something which without the prime now. And this is now a power series starting with one. Which is, uh, which I can view as some form of a partition function. It's actually, as we will see, uh, closely related to Nikasov partition function, a certain version of it. <coughs> um, and then we have the following multiplicativity result. Uh, so there are, so instead of this being just a polynomial in these things for all each coefficient of n, we have that the whole generating function here is a, a product of power series to these as powers. So, so there are some power series um, A1 until A7, because if I'm not mistaken, these were seven numbers, uh, which are power series, which are Laurent series in S and power series in Q. Uh, with uh, such that we can write 
this thing as a product over this. So uh, this thing said S A1 A2 S cube will be equal to A0 to the A1 squared A1 to the A1 A2 A2 to the A2 squared A3 to the A1 KS A4 to the A2 KS Yeah, now it doesn't seem to, uh, ah, so because I start with zero for unknown reasons, it didn't seem to add up to seven, but you know, if you start. Um, so the canonical class A6 to the KS squared and A7 to the holomorphic Euler factors. So we have this description. I can also roughly say what the idea of the proof is. First, First, we have to remember that this thing here, if we look at this A, this was somehow um, the sum over n1 plus n2 is equal to n, some integral over product of n1 times n2 of something. Now, you know, note that uh, if I take the Hilbert scheme, if I take the union of two surfaces, the disjoint union, and take the Hilbert scheme of points, you know, the, the subscheme splits into one subscheme on one and one subscheme on the other. So this is just the disjoint union over n1 plus n2 is equal to n of the Okay, so that means that this thing is, equal, is actually equal to the integral over S union S to the N of the same something. Okay, so maybe I write, so let me write S bar equal to S union S. So now, instead, obviously, then it also follows that if I take S1 bar disjoint union S2 bar, this is the same with the bars. So the only thing one has to see, so check that, uh, where is it? Uh, write it anywhere? Yeah. So check that um, if I take this expression here, A something, so this was psi of something. So if I take psi and restrict it to, so this thing is a disjoint union of these things. If I restrict it to such a factor, so, so now here right now, this is psi depending on s bar and n. So, so if I restrict this to s n1, so s bar n1 times s bar n2, then we would like this to be just psi of s bar n1 put back from the first factor times P2 upper star of spa N2. If this is the case, then it follows that you know, each term in the sum is a product, and if you make the generating function, it becomes a product of the things. So if you write uh, S as a disjoint union of two surfaces, and I should also say that uh, A1 is, uh, is, you know, is A11 on one and A12 on the other, and the same for A2. Uh, if it then splits up like this, 
uh, then it follows that the whole expression uh, splits up as a product. So it follows then, so if this is true, then it follows that Z of S1 union S2, um, where you have here, so to speak, A1 union A2, so it's A1, uh, A11 union A12, A22 union A2, and then whatever what have we have, S, Q, that this is just the product of the two factor of each of singular ones. So this is Z, S1, A1, Okay, so we find that it's a product like this. And now, <clears throat> if I look at the triple, so the, if I look at these numbers, uh, I can, nobody has forced me that S has to be irreducible, so I can, you uh, know, by just, uh, <clears throat> so I can, uh, uh, can use this to, so I, I can write, my given, I can reproduce the numbers uh, here by splitting up uh, S uh, A1 and 2 into factors like this. And uh, <clears throat> it will follow that it is a product, and I can, by some manipulations, write it as a product of the terms where these corresponding numbers are so that one is one and all the other ones are zero. And this then will give me these AI and uh, I get a product formula like this. So I said it a bit sketchy, but uh, it is quite simple uh, formal manipulation. <clears throat> and so then from this, so I just say from this, the result follows formally. Okay, so this is this multiplicativity. And um, so if we have this, <clears throat> Then, you no. Know, one should notice. Uh, well, okay. So, in particular, so this generating function is determined by these numbers. So, I just, in order to compute it for any surface and any a1 and a2, I only have to compute it for enough examples so that uh, these generating functions are determined. So, so, as we said, this ZS, A1, A2, SQ, depends only on this seven tuple. Uh, A1 squared, A1, A2, and so on. So, in order to determine it, for any S, A1, and A2, it is enough. We need to determine it for seven examples where such that these corresponding seven tuples are linear independent. So maybe I call this new S A1, A2, uh, such that the new S A1, A2 are linearly independent. And notice that uh, I made the assumption that B1 of S is zero and, B and PG of S should be positive, so rational surfaces are not allowed, but um, 
this was for the original question. Now we are just evaluating this integral over the Hilbert scheme. We can take any surface we want. And so in particular, we can take, so we can just, so we can just choose examples where S is, e, for instance, either P2 or P1 times P1. So we can choose these such that each time S is equal to P2 or S is equal to P1 times P1. That gives me enough uh, uh, numbers here if I change the line bundle. And so this is, uh, in particular, S is a toric surface. So a toric surface means, uh, let me see where do I have it. So that means means we have a C star times C star action. On S, which has a, a dense orbit and finitely many fixed points, but I maybe just write with finitely many fixed points. See, but so we want to uh, now we will want to in this case we can compute by localiz by equivalent localization. This was already, uh, I mean, used by in some other talks, but as mine is maybe supposed to be slightly more elementary, I will explain it in an elementary way. So if X is a, say, is say a smooth projective variety. So this is actually just a bot residue formula with an action of a torus T equal to C star to the K with finitely many fixed points. P1 to PE, then, um, uh, so if we look at the fixed point, so let P one of them, and so if I have, a, say, a vector bundle on uh, X, I can, uh, at the fixed point, so an equivalent vector bundle, so let E be a T equivalent vector bundle on X. Then I can, so then the, if I look at the fiber at the fixed point, the uh, T will act on the fiber Linearly, so then, then the fiber 
e t e of p at p at this fixed point uh, is a vector space with linear t action. So it splits, it has a basis of eigenvectors. So we can write EP is equal to the sum uh, from i equals 1 to the rank of the bundle of C times Vi, where Vi is an eigenvector. So if I have T1 to Tk in the torus, acting on it, this will act by some monomial, T1 to the n Uh, 1 comma i times t k to the n k comma i e i where these n i uh, j i are integers. So it just multiplies it by a lower monomial uh, of these uh, uh, elements of C star. And then we can say the weight of this vector vi is w of vi, which is the sum uh, j equals 1 to k of these nji epsilon j, where these epsilon j's epsilon 1 to epsilon k are some variables. So these actually would be coordinates at uh, the Lie algebra of the torus. But anyway, it's for us, it's just variables. And so then <coughs> uh, we can define some kind of the equivalent churn class of the fiber. This would be, you know, it's just the sum of the, so this is the total churn class, the sum of the churn classes. <coughs> uh, and uh, this will just be the product over all these VIs of the weights. <coughs> 1 plus the weight of the i. So that is a polynomial in these epsilon i's. This is actually would be the equivalent uh, churn class of this in equivalent cohomology. So this is actually. But you know, we can also just do this polynomials. And <coughs> so then the pot residue formula tells us we can compute uh, integrals in churn classes of such equivalent bundles by just computing with these uh, things. So, so pot residue formula. It says that, so, so say we are given some equivalent bu bundles, E1 to ES, uh, T equivariant vector bundles. On our given X, and we are given any polynomial, so let P of, so I just write C of E1 until C of ES, uh, a polynomial in the churn classes of the AI. Then it follows that if we want to evaluate on X this polynomial, Uh, 
we can do this by summing over the fixed points. And looking at the same expression in terms of these equivalent uh, things, so P of C of CT of 1 of P1, PJ, was S. So we just evaluate this. This is some polynomial in these epsilon i's. We divide by what would be the top churn class, so the simple two dimension of x, of the tangent bundle, also equivalently. So this will now be a rational function, epsilon 1 to epsilon S and uh, for instance, if I just put these equivalent variables all equal to, so this will be turn out to be regular in epsilon 1 to epsilon k. If I put them all equal to 0, then this gives me this expression. Okay, so this is this pot residue formula, and so one can apply this to our situation. So, uh, where am I? So we have to see how this works on Hilbert schemes of points. I mean, maybe for, I mean, okay. This was also used in some form already in other lectures, but you know, I uh, wanted to Maybe it's also useful for those who don't know, uh, who haven't seen this before. So we take such a smooth projective toric surface. indeed, so that is T equal to C star squared acts with fine to many fixed points, P1 to PE, say, um, so under the assumption that it's a toric surface, we actually have local coordinates near the fixed point which are eigenvectors for the actions. So they are coordinates xi, yi at pi for all i, um, which are eigenvectors, so such that, say, uh, t equal t1, t2 in t, uh, acts by T times, say, Xi is equal to, say, T1 to the N1 uh, I, T2 to the N2 I times That's a bit even more complicated. Uh, let me see. Yeah, why not? No, now I have to see how I get the numbers right. So this I maybe this is n1, comma i. This is m1, comma i, and then t times y i is equal to t1 to the n2, comma i, t2 to the m2. I times y. So these are eigenvectors, <coughs> where these are again these powers. So we have the weight of x i will be according to this n one i epsilon one plus n two i epsilon two, and the same here. No, the 
this was m one i and here have n two i epsilon one plus m two i epsilon. So it's very simple. So we have this action with finite many fixed points. And uh, we can see the action. Um, so now <coughs> this action will lift to the Hilbert schemes of points. So action lifts to the Hilbert scheme of n points on S. Namely, you can just say if you have a subscheme Z, um, you can just, so if I want T times Z, you can just take this as T of Z. Because uh, T, after all, it acts on S from S to S is an isomorphism. So if um, C is a fixed point, then it follows the support of C is a union of fixed points. So it's contained, so is union of fixed points. And so, therefore, we can write Z equal to Z1 until ZE, where the ZI, uh, so ZI supported at PI. And so, that is, ZI is given by an idea. in uh, C, X, I, Y, I, which, uh, or if you want, which has, a, which uh, with of finite co-dimension with support uh, at the origin in, in this. So, uh, and it should be, and this idea, I, C, I, So, and this ideal should also be invariant under the action. So, IZI is T invariant. And uh, uh, under our assumption, this can only be possible if it's generated by monomials. So that means we can write I C I as uh, Y I to the say M zero Y I to the M one times X I and so on. So uh, Y I to the M R. Uh, y i to the r uh, what y i to the m r x to the r and then find the x to the r plus one and obviously these numbers uh, must decrease so m zero bigger or equal to m one bigger or equal to MR. And um, now the, the sum of these numbers is the length of the subscheme ZI, or the, the degree of the subscheme ZI. So And uh, on the other hand, the sum of these, uh, the length of the subscheme is the, is the number n. So that means that uh, we have a, 
the bijection between the fixed points on the Hilbert scheme and tuples of partitions of n. Oh, pa tuples of partitions, so that uh, the total, the sum of the numbers partitions is n. So we get a bijection uh, fixed points t fixed points on Sn and uh, so this would be E tuples of partitions of numbers adding up to n. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> we can therefore apply, so now in our particular case, we have always a product of two Hilbert schemes. So if we compute, uh, so for us, for uh, this thing, A, S, A1, A2, N, S or S, N, I don't remember, maybe N, S, uh, we do have the, what we are computing is the integral over something over S union S, N, of this psi. So in this case, we have to the bot residue formula uh, will give us a formula, will uh, give a sum over uh, two e tuples of partitions. No, because we have yeah, two copies. Okay. <clears throat> and I will maybe can just, and now I cannot really start something new. So the, the first, so the, the thing is that uh, the fibers uh, at the fixed points on the Hilbert schemes Uh, of all the universal sheaths we are considering, so of uh, uh, this the tangent bundle of the Hilbert scheme or this Q of I A1, I1, A1, I2, A2, or uh, this, uh, uh, this tautological bundle, Um, so the fibers of, so here we have some, in this, in this Q with some extension groups, so, and here we have this tautological bundles. So all can be described in terms of the combinatorics. maybe explain this but next time so that means we get a combinatorial formula for this uh, expression for this a And therefore, for also for this partition function ZS. So there's also another thing which I will explain next time. Namely, one also finds there is a, if one looks at the expression, it has a very close relation to uh, the Neckershoff partition function. And uh, we can We'll see this next time. I think my time is up. So we see each other. Uh, oh, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>